All right, so here we've got a stereo 200 power amplifier um, and uh, the owner said that it had just gone bang and uh, distinct smell of burning and, and when we try and power up uh, we go through the routine and then we get the sort of red flashing light of doom there. Um, so let's say have a wee look inside and see what we've got to see what we've got to find there. Here we are inside, and uh, this is a, it's a very different amplifier from what we're used to looking at. Um, this is a class D amplifier or a, a switching amplifier, um, and uh, so we don't see all our usual array of uh, transistors and power transistors and, and uh, these kind of things. Um, uh, it's it's a much more simplified and integrated design. Uh, and I can see a problem right away, you know, we've got our two amplifier sections here uh, and uh, we can see there's a couple of fuses on each side there. And, and I say I can see the problem right away, the, one of my first frustrations is these fuses are covered covered with this, these little uh, diffusers here and, and you can't see through them, so you have to remove them to see if there's something gone wrong or not. And I can see that this fuse here has popped. Uh, so we're probably looking at some uh, transistors under this heat sink here that's uh, gone astray, uh, so we'll dig into that. Um, but uh, as I mentioned, class D amplifier, and we're, we're really relying on uh, this chip here. This chip here is uh, an IRS 2092 uh, from International Rectifier, as they were. Um, and this is a, a basically a class D amplifier driver. So you, you stuff audio in and you get a kind of um, pulse width modulation out that you drive your loudspeakers with. Uh, or, or or you drive your transistors with rather, and then uh, this guy here is an inductor, and these are two nice capacitors here. So this is our uh, low pass filter that then uh, uh, kind of uh, takes that uh, pulse width modulation, turns it back into audio. Um, so it's a very efficient design. <clears throat> it's maybe got some other limitations, but it's very efficient, and uh, uh, you know you're not generating huge amounts of heat, etc. And you can get uh, decent power levels in a small package. Um, so we'll look at we'll go and look at that device and see what that's about. Um, other things in here, you know, this is a it's a, a a little bit newer design and it's got to comply with the modern regulations where your standby power's got to be less than one watt. So they've got a dedicated supply here. Uh, yeah, so that the this uh, generates uh, like seven and a half volts, and then we're probably uh, post regulating down to five volts to drive the front panel and maybe some of the other circuitry in here. We've got some other power supply stuff in here that will be driving our op amps and the like. Um, well, that's all pretty normal stuff. Uh, so, uh, let's go and have a look at this the data sheet for this part and then we'll maybe start to we'll remove the, this heat clip here and we'll see what's underneath that. Here's the data sheet for this part then and uh, it's not an overly detailed data sheet, it's more like a kind of application note here. Um, we've got some of the specs and some of the sort of high level capability here. So it's given us, I mean, I can see a distortion number there, 0.01%, which is, you know, that's not anywhere near as good as some of the straight transistor amplifiers that we've seen. Um, so we'll, we'll measure that uh, once we're finished here. Uh, we'll look at some of the noise floors, etc. Um, but uh, as, as I mentioned, you know, a, a class D amplifier, all very integrated. So we've got this, uh, you feed your audio in, you've got this chip, and then you've got a pair of power transistors. Um, and if we scroll further through this data sheet, um, uh, we can see the sort of internal structure of that device, the sort of block diagram there. And then we've got an application diagram. And this is essentially what's going to be in our stereo 200. Uh, just going to have a couple of these. Uh, uh, these transistors here that they're calling out, these are surface mount devices. Um, but we've obviously got some other uh, heavier duty guys uh, connected to the heat sink there. So we'll have a look at that. Uh, and, but that's it. Uh, you know, there's uh, uh, not sort of... Uh, like many many years of development by uh, Cyrus here. This is a, a data sheet application that they've lifted and uh, added their own stuff. You know, I did the power supplies and the control and uh, all that kind of stuff too. Um, and if we take a quick look at the Cyrus web page here, it's uh, you know there's the usual marketing stuff here. Um, class D blah blah hybrid. Now, what do they mean by hybrid? That sounds like it's kind of uh, kind of fancy. Something's clever's going on there. 
Um, and I suspect what it is is that you, you know we're dealing with an integrated circuit and we're dealing with discrete transistors. So it's 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 not all integrated. It's not all discrete. Um, so it's not uh, you know there's no sort of uh, fancy new development here. That's that's all that's about. Um, um, but let's go and uh, we'll get the, the heat clip off there, we'll find out what transistors they're using and then uh, see where we're going to go from there. Alright, we're a bit we're a bit further on now, we've got uh, the, this heat uh, plate removed here and there's a couple of screws that hold this in, one at the top and then the one on the side. And when I removed the one at the top, this thing was kind of floating around. So I think this is really the core of the problem, this has not been tightened up properly these transistors have not been fully engaged with the chassis and so they've probably got a bit hotter than they should do and then eventually one of them's expired. Um, so I think that's been the mechanism here, it's not been, you know, we've not had any shorts or uh, sort of anything untoward externally happening. Uh, um, and so anyway, uh, looking at what we've got here, we've got a couple of power fets here as we expect from the block diagram or the, or the data sheet there. Um, we've also got a, an NPN a, a transistor, a bipolar transistor here. Um, so I'm not entirely sure what that's about. We'll, we'll find that out when we get the board out. Um, but that's what we've got. And, uh, you know, a quick check on these FETs here. Uh, we're looking for shorts, obviously. And as soon as I look at this guy here, I've got a short there, drain to source, dead short. So this guy's gone short. And if we... Uh, check between that and this fuse that's burst indeed that's the that's the rail that's gone wrong this fet seems okay um but you know when a transistor goes like like this one has it generally takes out a bunch of this extra circuitry so we'll probably find that we have to replace this ic and uh, maybe some of the other discrete semiconductors in there um, but at least we know what's going on now, looks repairable, so we'll get the heat clip off the other side, we'll get the board out and uh, see where that takes us. Alright, so we've got the board out and uh, we can take a closer look at uh, some of the sections here. And, and this, you know, very small footprint here, this is, our, this is the entire power amp, uh, this I see, some of these discrete parts and then the two FETs. And then we've just got this passive uh, LC output filter. Um, before we go to our speaker ports, and and that's it. That you know that small board area is the really the entire power amp, um, and it kind of amuses me to see these little uh, uh, bumper feet thing he, uh, items here that they've just put on the transistors, and then the 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 plate, uh, the securing plate is kind of bumping up against them. It's kind of hmm. well, anyway. Um, let's take a look at. Uh, the sort of input side then. So we've got our balanced and unbalanced and uh, I've got some relays here that are going to switch between the two of them. I've got some op-amp circuitry uh, that'll probably convert the uh, balanced input to a single-ended input and then we feed our, feed our amp section from there. Um, there is some sort of analog switching in here. I'm not entirely sure what that's about. It could be to do with the, the sort of variable uh, a load sensing thing that they were talking about in the on their web page there um, but anyway uh, that's as much I've really got to see in here it's not you know it's just uh, it's so uh, integrated there's not too much to not too much to observe um, so we'll get this dodgy fit out we'll probably take the whole lot of them out and uh, uh, we'll see what's going on there we'll get some new parts ordered up and uh, hopefully that's going to take care of the take care of the issues here all right, so we've got these FETs out of the board and uh, I was a wee bit surprised to find that they measured just perfectly when they uh, measured them out of the board. So the short was still on the board somewhere and uh, after a bit of rummaging I found, uh, a, you know, here's our FETs and we've got this output LC filter and on the output we've just got a couple of diodes here uh, going to the supply rails uh, and these are generally just for protection, you know, it means that the, the voltage here can't go any higher or lower than the than the two different supply rails. And one of these guys had gone short and that's what was causing our problem. I mean, it, when we measure it, it looks like the diodes are in parallel with the FETs because this inductor's got pretty, you know, near zero resistance. 
um, but that's where we are. So uh, this is the this is the guy here. So let's just do a quick measurement, uh, just to show. And there we are, dead short on there. And the FETs uh, measure just fine. There's our, you can see the body diode there. So they're okay. Um, and then the other thing is we, we had this other transistor in here which puzzled me slightly when uh, when I saw it. And uh, this is for, uh, when we look at the schematic for the for the for this uh, class D amplifier chip, it requires a, a 12 volt supply off the minus rail. And that's what this guy's generating. It's just a, it's just a, a, a power supply um, for one of the rails on that guy. Uh, so nothing fancy again. Uh, so we'll get this diode replaced and uh, uh, put everything else back in and we'll just see how this thing's behaving now. Everything's uh, back together now then and uh, it seems to be working uh, just fine. Um, and I've got uh, the input terminated here. I've got the output connected to a load and then we're looking at the output on the scope. And uh, if we crank up the time base on the scope, we can see this odd waveform here. And this is actually the switching frequency of the amplifier. This is uh, running about 280 kilohertz here. Um, so that's uh, switching away. And then uh, when we're using this as an amplifier, you know, we're modulating that waveform. And there is, there is some sort of residual modulation on that with no audio going in. And if we drop our time base right down, uh, we can see here, you can see this ripple, and this is about 10 hertz. So there's a kind of 10 hertz kind of uh, bit of jitter going on with that uh, uh, switching frequency, uh, which is probably not unusual either. Um, quite a high level here. We've got about five and a half volts peak to peak on the output of the amplifier here. Um, and the thing is though that your loudspeaker is never going to respond to this waveform, it's too high frequency. So we're relying on the, we're relying on the loudspeaker uh, to, to act as a filter as well, you know, as a mechanical filter, it's just never going to respond to that. Uh, so should take that out. Uh, now if we drop our frequency down and then we uh, put some signal on, you can see we've got a much bigger waveform there. And uh, if I zoom in, I can't really trigger on this because of all that jitter here. So I can only do like a single sweep. So there's one kilohertz and you can see the switching frequency on top of that. So it looks quite horrendous on a scope here. But as I say, this, this kind of stuff here is filtered by your loudspeaker. I mean, I mean the, the filter in the unit is doing a, you know, it's taking away a, a whole load of the switching component, but it can't get rid of it completely. And this is just what you're left with. Uh, and if we uh, pick a level here, so there's about 17 odd volts, and if I increase my frequency uh, until we drop to about 12 volts here, that's going to tell us the bandwidth of this thing. Uh, and what I found was it was probably about 60 kilohertz, which is quite low again by a modern hi fi amplifier standard. That's quite a low. Uh, bandwidth that we're talking about here, but this is another limitation of class D amplifiers. You know, we've got this output filter there that's uh, designed to get rid of the switching frequency, and we can't we can't really go beyond that. Uh, we've got to operate well within the bandwidth of that filter, uh, and uh, so it's a limitation here. We're obviously going to have some phase effects and things here that's maybe a bit undesirable. Um, and if I if I uh, uh, do a single capture on that and we zoom in, you can see how bad that looks. You know, that's our 60 kilohertz with the switching frequency on top. It's really horrendous uh, there. Um, so that's where we are. Uh, all quite normal though for a class D amplifier. Um, so I think the next thing, we'll put it on the audio analyzer and we'll look at what the noise floor is like and we'll look at what the, some of this uh, funny waveforms and things will look like, uh, look at uh, how that uh, looks in the uh, frequency domain. Right, connected to the audio analyzer now and the output, and uh, yeah, let's put some averaging on here. Uh, and I mean, the noise floor's not, it's not brilliant, but it's not horrendous either. You know, we're kind of used to seeing something just about below the 110 mark with some of the mono X type amps, etc. Um, and we're actually a little bit lower than that here, uh, you know, between about a K and up to about 10K. 
a little bit of dip there, so fair enough. Goes a bit higher at the lower frequencies, and we've obviously got a, a pile of uh, you know 50 hertz and uh, harmonics all the way going up there. So that's a bit rubbish, kind of not what we like to see. But um, again, for the type of amplifier we're talking about here, it's not uh, not overly concerning. Uh, pretty much what we expect. Only looking at 20k here now. So what we'll do is we'll we'll crank up. We'll look at a much wider bandwidth, and uh, we'll we'll see some of that switching frequency come in there. And just see how that looks like. You can see this this noise flow is beginning to lift here, and I suspect as we go up in frequency, we'll see a bit more of that. So let's just wind up our bandwidth. Right here we are, looking uh, all the way up to a megahertz now on the output, uh, and we can see there's our uh, this is our 280 kilohertz uh, switching frequency. We can see that's the dominant component, um, and that's peaking about minus 10 dBV. So probably probably somewhere near 10 millivolts we're getting there into 8 ohms so, so it's a fairly low level and as, as we mentioned you know our loudspeaker's never going to respond to that um, so a lot of this stuff's really kind of filtered out we can see the sub harmonics and then we can see the harmonics going up there um, so no surprises here uh, again just what you expect from a class D amplifier but it's just kind of useful to put the numbers on this thing uh, so we'll go back, uh, we'll drop the bandwidth down again and uh, we'll actually just look at some distortion numbers and uh, that should be us here. Right here we are with uh, 10 watts on the output uh, and uh, measuring 0 0.005, 0 0.006%. So maybe not quite as good as some of the linear amplifiers that we generally look at but it, you know it's not it's not uh, unrespectable at all really there at uh, 10 watts. Um, Let's say we'll just crank up the power, we'll maybe go up to 100 watts and see what it looks like there. Alright, here we are with 100 watts on the output here, you can see the, see the numbers there. Uh, and uh, things start to go a bit wrong here, we can see our noise floors rising rapidly there, uh, even just at this power. Uh, distortion wise actually we're still, you know, there's 0.05 kind of numbers there, um, but that's not taking into account this noise floor. So, uh, uh, you know, as I say, going over 100 watts, we're getting into trouble there. Um, so the spec of 200 odd watts, you know, on, on the on the sort of documentation, uh, that's clearly not a continuous level, and uh, that you know they don't specify what the performance is, etc. These kind of numbers. So uh, anyway, that's a uh, you know this is what we've got. Um, so not you know not unrespectable for a switching amp. Uh, it doesn't quite compare with a uh, standard linear amp, but uh, all the same. Uh, so I think uh, you know pretty much done now. Here we're going to have a listen, and uh, that should wrap this one up. Well, yeah, we're all done now. Then this is our uh, stereo 200 all back together. Then and uh, you know a different kind of amplifier for us here, but uh, uh, quite nice to look through the the class D implementation. Look at some of the numbers there, uh, and uh, yeah, so all running. Uh, I think we just need to play it for a while now and then uh, make sure we're all settled so let's have a go <laughs> 